I would like to call this annual city meeting of the City of Virgins to order. Would you all please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you, everyone. It's good to see you all here. Thanks for coming out on this uh, not-so-snowy March evening, but thanks for being here. Uh, I would like to welcome and thank the City Council for a great year. We've had a lot of work to do, and we've gotten a lot accomplished. And I do want to recognize Alderman Dave Small, who will be leaving the City Council tomorrow. Uh, and so thank you for your service, Dave. And I would like to introduce all of you to Daniel Hoffman. If you've not already met Daniel, he is our new city manager. We're very, very excited to have him here, and it's been a busy couple of months already. Thank you, Daniel. Welcome. Thank you. And the other new face up here tonight is Morgan Kittredge, our new city clerk down at the end. Welcome, Morgan. Our new city treasurer, Abby Farrar, is not here this evening, but I encourage everyone to stop into City Hall and say hello to her and welcome her. She's actually been here for about seven or eight months working with us, and uh, as of last Friday, became our new city clerk. Treasurer. 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 Thank you. We have our new city clerk down there. <laughs> and welcome again. Yeah. Uh, we may have to be a little loose about our schedule this evening because we're waiting for our legislative representatives to show up. In the meantime, uh, I'm going to ask Chief Merkel if he would like to share a few words with us. I see that Representative Byron and Representative Lanfer have just entered the room. I know you're just walking in, but uh, if one of you would like to take the floor, it's yours. Thank you. Um, hi, good evening. Sorry we're a couple minutes late. Thanks. Um, Diane Lanfer, live in Virgins, my town. Been in the legislature now, thanks to your terrific support for 12 years. And uh, continue, I'll try to breathe here up the stairs. <laughs> so, uh, I can honestly say that uh, this is the second session that some of the new legislators are with us and, and Representative Barong, and you're gonna hear from, I think coming in is gonna be Senator Ruth Hardy, who was also elected the first time in this last election. And we have been working as a team much better. I mean, not that we ever were bad, but um, now that there's a little bit more of a veteranness underneath them, uh, Matt and I have teamed up in the House and I can honestly say that we have made some significant differences on some major bills and the direction they were going. And I'm really, really proud of the work that we've done on those um, and a few other things. I still serve on the House Appropriations Committee. And because of your terrific support on sending me there, that's one level of support. And then once that I'm there, I've earned the right and the respect of my colleagues that they put me in that place of 
of honor and of responsibility. And it is a tremendous responsibility. And, and I'm very grateful for all of it. And some days, maybe not so much. <laughs> but uh, so with that, because I, I have that, I live in, in Montpelier during the week. And I come home on the weekend. And I know many of you know I take care of my grandson, who is now three years old at that time, so coming home this, this week is a, is a nice break. We are at the halfway point of this session. So many of the bills that we are very excited to have gotten over to the Senate in time, I'm sure that when they return back from the Senate in May, they're gonna look a lot different from when we sent them over. And then I, I won't uh, interrupt you too much, but there's only one more that I wanna tell you that I'm extraordinarily proud of on the happy news end was, oh, he's here, here he is. <laughs> the star of the legislature. <laughs> we ha I introduced a bill, H-775, and a lot of that reasoning had to come from the youth's voice, and especially those of, in the Virgins here. El an elder is definitely one of them, who um, the responsibility that, that we have to hand off a world to the next generation is not lost on, on pretty much all of us. And they came to Montpelier and let us know on a pretty regular basis exactly what they want their legislature to be paying attention to and the issues that they have. So, um, and I think, I think we've done a pretty good job on, on that, but there's not a formal way for youth to have an actual input into uh, government and governance. And I met with many of the students who are active in that area and uh, visitors who were here from Helsinki in the summer and in the fall, two students who actually, in their country, it is by law that they have input on what happens at local level and at the state level and the federal level. So my bill uh, would create a youth voice council that would be a all statewide council that would have a formal way for students from uh, age 11 to 21 is the, is the range to be able to have um, input and advice and their opinion <coughs> heard uh, in, uh, in the state. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Matt. I know you guys have a lot of work to do tonight and we're gonna try to make Addison if we make it down there in time. So Representative Barong. Thank you. Thank you. All right, how's everybody doing? I know most of you know me, uh, but those of you who don't, my name's Matt Byrog. I'm the other representative for this district. Um, live in Virgins myself, along with uh, Representative Lamphere, so it's great to be here with the hometown crowd. Um, so in the legislature, you know, we all have our various committee assignments, Representative Lamphere's on appropriations. Uh, I serve in a different policy committee. Uh, the title of that committee is kind of kind of funny. Uh, it's called uh, General Housing and Military Affairs, right? So housing obviously speaks for itself. Military affairs is just that, veterans affairs, National Guard issues. And the general part is kind of broad. Um, our primary focus is under that are labor law, um, you know, sort of uh, various other topics around uh, Abnaki, Native American stuff, and also another big component of that is dealing with uh, oversight of DLC, liquor, lottery, tobacco, uh, things of that nature. So like sort of like all the vice taxes and stuff like that, right? Um, so we've been working on a few bigger pieces this year that we've got our fingers into. Uh, probably the one we spent the most time on is uh, a recovery housing bill. So this, uh, this particular bill would help uh, increase the number of beds statewide for people in various aspects of recovery. Um, it's, a, it's a very important um, dire need that we're facing right now as a state with opiate issues and other addiction issues that we are facing in our urban areas, our suburban areas, and our rural areas. So we've put a lot of time in on that one. Um, and just voted out of our committee a week or two ago, and hopefully we can see that keep moving along. Um, another piece that I've personally been involved with is uh, back to sort of like the liquor lotto thing. Um, the governor has been pushing for an expansion of the lottery programs, primarily in uh, the realm of uh, Keno and um, sports betting, right? So like basically like gambling on your, uh, your phones more or less, like DraftKings kind of stuff. So the legislature's still not sure where they're at with that, 
but uh, my committee chair kind of maybe the point person on those topics. So I've had a, a lot of time in uh, on those particular issues. Uh, there's been a lot of big stuff moving around. You know, we had the, the Global Warming Solutions Act went through, Act 250 stuff, a few other big pieces. So instead of kind of guessing what you want to talk about, I'm going to throw it out to the floor right now and see if anybody has any questions on any of those topics or any other topics. So, oh, come on. <laughs> Kino, yeah, it's like it's like it's like video bingo, right? It's like it's like betting quarters on a Pac-Man table. Uh, no, no, I'm not a huge fan of the Kino thing. Um, we've looked into it. That seems to be um, an exceptionally regressive form of recreational game, uh, gaming. Um, no, it really is. I mean, it's it really targets the wrong art audiences, in in my opinion. So um, the, the sports betting one, that's, yeah, I've done a lot of homework on that. I, I went out to a conference in San Diego for uh, legislative gaming states. That was an interesting crowd. Um, I had no idea there were that many casinos in Michigan. Um, so it really, um, it, I, I would say I still have concerns with it, but I have less concerns with that particular aspect of, of lotto expansion. But um, you know we've got a couple of weeks in front of us. The legislation on that's a Senate bill, so I'm sitting back right now waiting to see if they send it over to us. So we'll know in a week or so if that's a real conversation. Anyone else? Yeah. Following the truck study that was recently done about truck traffic in the area, VTrans recommended a proposal for a study of a, a detailed study of an alternate route around the city. That's going to need legislative approval and uh, authorization. I wonder if you know the status of. Correct. So um, the that project um, is we we got um, letters of support, uh, some strong, some not as strong, but still letters of support from the surrounding communities uh, that we needed to hear from. And this is uh, involving the uh, Virginia's Economic Corridor. Um, if you didn't pick up on that, and so the transportation budget was uh, we were the project was allocated two hundred thousand dollars for this year. For this year. Yep. Yes. Um, so yeah. So that's the that's the first step of uh, of a very long process. Is is we are like officially a line item in the transportation budget for this project now. So we will see positive momentum on that economic development piece. Um, so yes, as uh, Representative Lamf Lamfer was just alluding to, uh, she and I do uh, coffee with constituents across the street at the cafe every two weeks. Uh, you can check out either of our uh, social media pages to see what the dates are. And as always, feel free to uh, reach out, phone calls, text messages, emails, all that stuff with any questions or concerns. All right, um, I guess with that, we're gonna try and make it down to Addison before they fold up all their chairs and go home for the evening. And uh, unless there's anything else. All right, Thank cool. Thank you. Senator Hardy. Uh, hi, sorry, we were just coordinating. Um, uh, uh, my name is Senator Ruth Hardy. I'm one of your two state senators. Uh, your other one is Senator Chris Bray, and I believe at this point he's probably at the Middlebury Town Meeting. He and I uh, split up as many towns as we could to cover as many bases as possible. Um, so thank you for having me here in Virgins. Um, I'm actually from East Middlebury, so it's really a pleasure to come up here and see how different towns in my district run their town meetings. I, I have noticed a theme that your town meeting covers up here are purple, and I love that because that's my favorite color. So, thank you. Um, so, in the Senate, we serve on two committees. Um, I serve on the Education Committee and the Agriculture Committee. And I can give you just tiny updates on those. Um, uh, in the Agriculture Committee, we've worked on, we're working on a bill on pesticide oversight um, to try to get a handle on how we can better reduce the use of pesticides. Um, we are also, we work, we just passed a bill on chickens and compost, which was fascinating. Um, so I can tell you more details if you're interested. Um, and um, my favorite bill that we're working on is a bill that would provide incentives to our local schools 
schools to buy more local foods for their food service programs. Um, this is something that I hope will benefit the Addison Northwest District because you have a fabulous food service director who buys a lot of local foods from Addison County farmers. Um, so hopefully it will be win-win for our Addison County schools and our Addison County farmers if the bill passes. Um, so we're also working on sort of a broader picture um, economy of the economics of agriculture in Vermont. We have a bunch of reports, including a recent dairy marketing report that we're parsing through to see what recommendations we may be able to turn into effective legislation. Um, so that's what we've worked on in ag so far. In education, we've done a lot of miscellaneous things, including statewide health care bargaining for teachers, just updating that law, updating um, provisions regarding the State Board of Education, um, special education laws, um, a lot of miscellaneous topics, some involving higher education. Um, uh, we did a bill that would hopefully lay the groundwork for a universal after-school program that may be a few years down the road. Um, you all are super lucky that here you have the um, Boys and Girls Club that runs a great after-school program and they are one of the models that this um, a committee will be looking at. Um, we also passed a bill on libraries, which was actually my bill, because I love libraries, and you all have a lovely library here, the Bixby Library. Um, there hasn't been a status report on the status of libraries in Vermont for many, many years, I think 15 or 20 years, and the standards that our libraries use are actually from 1986. Um, so a lot has happened since then in the world of libraries, as in the world in general. Um, so we're hoping to get an update on how we can better support all of the amazing, many diverse things that our libraries do. Um, there are some bills coming over from the House that we'll be dealing with in the second half of the, uh, the, second half of the legislative session. As Matt and Diane may have mentioned, March 13th is crossover when the bills cross from one house to the other. So we'll be getting their bills and they'll be getting our bills. Um, the Senate has also been working on criminal justice reform. We passed some major changes to our furlough system. We have one of the most complex furlough systems in the country, and a lot of people are actually sent back to prison for technical violations of furlough. And not only is it really bad for um, people who are caught in our incarceration system, but it's also really expensive. So by making these changes, we um, should be able to save uh, about $2 million over the next four years and we'll be reinvesting that into transitional housing for people coming out of prison, and also um, domestic violence prevention, which is a big issue with um, uh, people in our uh, state, just in general, but in our incarceration system. Um, so I'm really proud of that legislation. We're working on climate legislation um, and economic legislation as well, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have in any area, really. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. where is, where is that? That? Yes, thank you for mentioning that. I forgot to mention that. Um, there was, it's called the waiting study. That's the, what we're all calling it. And it looked at how we count students in our funding formula for the statewide funding formula. Um, right now, students are weighted based on a number of factors, including poverty, um, secondary education, English language learners, pre-K, um, and other factors. And this really took a big look at whether our, the weights we give students are appropriate. And it turns out that they're not. Um, so the study recommends changing the way that we count students and counting students who are living in poverty, who are English language learners, or who come from districts that are very remote rural districts, namely the Northeast Kingdom, um, counting them more and giving more funding to those districts. It actually turns out that it would be fairly neutral for the Addison Northwest District. Um, and, mo and all of the Addison County districts actually. We are what I like to say kind of the middle income and middle districts on so many areas. We do a really great job. Um, but so we're still looking at the implications. What I think we're gonna end up doing is putting into place some kind of implementation working group to figure out how to move forward. I think a lot of us think it's probably the right thing to do, but it has a, a huge a lot, a huge number of implications statewide, so we need to make sure we take it slowly and do the right thing, because as you all know very well, our school districts are quite stressed right now, and we don't want to add to that stress. So thank you for that question. 
Are there other questions? Yeah. Hi, I'm Ray Walker, major painter. Um, Hi. Uh, thank you for your service. Um, thinking back about the times that you were actually in a fully attended meeting of the Senate or a fully attended meeting of the full legislature, is there ever a time when you were successfully persuaded to change your opinion based on the real-time discussion or presentation or debate? Absolutely. That. Especially if you could give an example of a time when you changed your opinion basically from the Republican Party. Like, does that ever happen? What do you mean, that, that I've been convinced? Yeah, I'm sorry. to change your opinion by a Republican in real time. Is that um, <laughs> uh, wow, you put me on the spot for coming up with a fast example. Um, I'd love to know, what was the, the time you were happiest with that real time meeting? So I would encourage you to come up and, and maybe spend a day with me so you can sort of see how it works. I'd love, I'd love to have people come visit. So any of you, you're all welcome. Don't come all on the same day, but um, any of you who wanna come spend the day with me, I'd love to have you. Um, but I would say that the Senate in particular, um, and I don't want to, Matt and Diane are still back there, so I have to be careful what I say. <laughs> but I think the Senate in particular is fairly nonpartisan. In, and it's easy for me to say as a Democrat, because there are only three, or there are only six Republicans out of 30. Um, but the vast majority of our votes are unanimous. And that I think is true in the House as well. Um, the vast majority of what we vote on we all end up agreeing with once it gets to the floor. Uh, the big work of the legislature is done in committee where we hash out um, how are we gonna do this thing? Um, and in my two committees, the Agriculture Committee, one of the five members is a Republican, one of the five members is a, pro a progressive, and three of us are Democrats. Um, and we all, we work toward consensus among the five of us to make sure that we all agree. We've never, in my now two years there, almost two years, all of our votes in committee have been unanimous. So we really work to try to find something we all can live with. Um, in the Education Committee, we've had maybe two votes that haven't been unanimous. Um, so I think we all try to persuade each other and respect each other's opinions and try to find something that will work for all of us. Um, I can't think of a specific example, but um, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for all of my colleagues and I've learned a lot from them and I hope I've persuaded them and I can give you examples of how I've persuaded my colleagues. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I don't think it's as partisan. Vermont, we are really super lucky that we have a legislature that works together and that we don't divide on party lines for the most part. There are obviously some issues that we've divided on recently, um, uh, but the vast majority of things are are by tripartisan. Um, so I'm proud of that and happy to be part of a legislature that does that. That being said, you know, I will fight for what I think is right. Um, and that's why you elected me. So uh, I'm no pushover. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, thank you so much for having me. I, I really appreciate it. Have a good town meeting. Thank you, Senator. Moving right along, uh, John Straub from the Addison Northwest School District is here to say a few words to us this evening. Good evening, John. Hello, everyone. My name is John Straub, and um, I live here in Virginia. It's good to be here with you. Um, I am on the Addison Northwest School Board District. Um, my colleagues are here. One is not, Mark Koenig, who um, is absent today, uh, but he is on the board as with, uh, with me as well as a representative here. Keith Morrill, my friend and our colleague, he's right there, that's Keith, good. Um, yeah, there you go, good, you can clap for him. And then um, Sue Rakowski, folks, right there. Uh, look, Sue is, um, has been on the board for many years and she has been the chair of the school board for the last three years, and um, it's it just an enormous effort that she has put in on all of our behalf, and um, it's just a big, a big loss for all of us because um, she has essentially been the person to lead us from these various uh, school districts to consolidation, brought in a school. Um, new uh, a new superintendent i mean the effort is just huge so when you see her tell her thanks she's right over there 
Um, the last one, though, is Alder. I want to say thanks to him as well. Where did he go? There he is. He's right there. Okay, so Alder Donovan has also been um, a member of the school board as a student representative. As far as I know, we will not have a representative from the Virgins area from the high school. So Alder, find someone from our neighbors. And if you know some neighbors um, who would be willing to serve, Alder has been um, a great voice and uh, he will be graduating. We want to thank you for your service as well. Okay, I'm going to uh, lay out a couple of numbers quickly, and then I'm going to try to tell the story. Here are the numbers. Uh, we have two articles that we'll be voting on. One is the school budget. That's Article 7. We also have another article that we'll be, be voting on. That's Article 8. Article 8, I'm going to just briefly describe it. It sets up a health reserve fund. Health care increases are going up this year by 14%. The increases of health care are enormous, and they are very tough to budget for. And we're going to ask you all, ask the district, to um, use whatever excess funds that we have this year, up to 200000 to be able to create a fund to sort of balance our budgets year after year with these just wild swings in um, our health care. The second... Uh, the second article that uh, we're going to be asking you to vote on is the school budget. This number will not change. The school budget decreases expenditures by 1.3%. We do not know of a single district in the entire state that has decreased spending. No one. And we, what we have come to understand is that Spending in school districts throughout the state has, is going to average about 4% increase. And if you can just think about how budgets work with 14% incre increase in um, health care and other expenditures going up, the, the, the effort to get to a, a decreased budget is enormous. That said, due to declining enrollment, our taxes will go up. That is a big problem. That is a big deal. It's something that we have to, to deal with. So we have tried to keep every single program for all of our kids, every single program, cut the budget and keep it at a place that's manageable and affordable for all of us. Um, we are make some big investments, um, some investments that uh, we're going to put in. We're going to finally be able to bring our health and physical education up to um, the, the criteria that the state sets for us. Um, we are going to pay our people a wage that is, um, that is appropriate for the, the, the district and our surrounding neighbors. So um, it's Article 7. We've worked really hard on it. Um, you have not been a part of many of the conversations at the voting booth this year. Um, but I have heard from many of you, and I know my colleagues have heard from many of you, and we really appreciate your support. It's been a really difficult year, um, and I hope that you'll show up um, tomorrow and uh, support this budget and uh, Article 8 as well. Thank you. Thank you, John. Next, uh, we'll have a little update on our upcoming paving project by City Manager Hoffman. Thank you. So this morning, um, myself, Deputy Mary Donnelly, uh, my public works supervisor, and um, Julie from the Virgins Partnership, we attended a pre-construction meeting for the Main Street Paving Project. Um, this was the first meeting I attended uh, for this project. And um, the project, or the, the meeting, really started off um, by addressing some legal matters in the contract between the contractor and VTrans. Um, but really, uh, the two big questions we had for them um, was one, the schedule of, of the paving project, and uh, number two, uh, parking is a big concern as well as far as parking spaces. Um, when, when the project's all done, how many parking spaces we'll, we'll have or we'll lose. So we, we asked those questions. Um, the project is slated to begin in Virgins the first or second week in April, but they're going to start on the outskirts of Main Street, and they're going to start with um, shoulders and driveways, and they're not to start downtown um, the center of Virgins 
uh, before May before Memorial Day. So that in the contract, there's a Memorial Day restriction where they they can't touch the downtown area before Memorial Day. Other than that, the the scheduling is pretty um, variable at this time because of uh, you know the the weather can change any day and you know no no one knows what's going to happen uh, tomorrow. So it's kind of it's kind of up in the air. Other than they're going to start early in April <clears throat> and conclude in October, and we just wanted um, you know to voice our concerns about the Memorial Day event, that, uh, the parade that we have on Memorial Day, for Jen's Day, and you know, Bristol has their own concerns with uh, events that they hold. So we, we voice those concerns, and we also talked to the engineer about um, the parking situation um, and ways to really uh, you know, uh, conceptualize how the parking's gonna look and if, if we're gonna be okay with that before we uh, solidify everything uh, with the project. <clears throat> and in addition, we have a new um, public relations consultant from VTrans. They, they hired a consultant to you know, kind of be a liaison between the public and um, the project managers. So I'll be passing around a sign-up sheet. If you want to put your name and email um, on the sheet, uh, this, um, her name is Natalie Boyles, and she will be sending out weekly and sometimes twice a week emails updating um, everyone on this on this list as to what's going to what's going to happen next uh, from week to week um, because things change so, so much uh, due to weather and other other variables so um, i'll be passing this around feel free to put your uh, name and email on here i just ask that it try try to make it as legible as possible because she'll have to put it onto her email list and um, do you want to add anything about the meeting? That's yeah, good. I, there's going to be a public or a oh, informational right. meeting. Yeah, thank you. So um, I'm trying to coordinate having an informational for the public where VTrans, the, the engineer, this public relations coordinator, will, will come and um, anyone, can, anyone from the public can come and ask whatever questions or concerns you might have. Also, the public relations coordinator um, person is going to be going door to door with all the businesses um, in Virgins and introducing herself and giving her contact information personally as well. So um, we'll try to be as transparent and open and please bring any questions, comments, concerns uh, to me or to the public relations coordinator. Um, and we've also created a pamphlet for you that kind of addresses some key points uh, for this project. Um, and, I think that's and we'll have that out back at the end of the meeting. Yes. Any questions about the paving project? Moving right along then. Uh, John Kidda has asked for a few moments of our time this evening to talk about public engagement at future town meetings. John. Come on up. Pass this out. My name is John Kidda. I live in Virgins, and I have been attending most of these town meetings since uh, 2008 when I moved to the town. And I love seeing everybody here. I feel like there's a real opportunity for greater engagement, though. So most of these meetings are kind of like one-way information, and they're informational. But I think that when I look at this group, so this is kind of like a soft proposal. When I look at the people who come to these meetings, they want to be engaged, and I think that there might be an opportunity to have uh, small group discussions around topics that matter to the people who live in this town. So it would be an opportunity to restructure part of the town meeting day to hold small group discussions around topics that are of interest to you all, such as maybe the paving, maybe the recreation committee work, maybe Article 2, there's lots of different topics that um, I think we could actually provide input to our representatives. So I'm interested actually genuinely in just a show of hands as this soft proposal around like who is interested in this. If there's really nothing, then it's dead. But if there's interest, then I will coordinate a small group of people to explore this and try to make something happen for next year. So if you're interested, if you would raise your hand, that would be great. If you're not, that's fine. I would say we have interest. All right, great, thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you, John.
Let's move into business, shall we? I'm looking for a motion to approve the minutes from the annual city meeting of March 4th, 2019. I'll make the motion. Motion is made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion made and seconded we'll let David do it. by Alderman Small. His last, his, his last second. <laughs> Were there any additions or corrections to the minutes from the meeting? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Minutes are approved. And now we will move into the business of our warning. Let me get to it. Of the annual city meeting of March 3rd, 2020. The qualified voters of the city of Virgins are hereby warned and notified that the annual city meeting will be held at the Virgins Opera House in City Hall on Monday, March 2nd, 2020 commencing at 7.30 p.m. for the following. Article one, to elect by Australian ballot three aldermen for respective two-year terms. I do believe we have four candidates for these three seats and all four are present. And I would ask those who are interested in saying something to please take the opportunity now. We'll start alphabetically with Tara Brooks. So if it's okay, I'm gonna actually read mine because I get up here and then I look at somebody and I get distracted. Um, so, and then I like wave at people and it gets bad. Um, so I'm Terry Brooks and I live on Main Street with my husband Josh and my three daughters. Um, I'm a native Vermonter and a Mountain graduate, but please do not hold that against me. Um, I'm excited for the opportunity to run for office in Virgins. Um, I've spent my whole adult life living in Virgins. I served as the city's first recreation director as the advanced manager for the Virgins Opera House, as the executive director of the Virgins Partnership, and I'm currently the director of the after school and summer services for the Addison Northwest School District. I have civil experience as well. I've served seven years in the Virgins Elementary School Board, chairing the board for three of those years. I'm the current president of the Virgins Swim Team and the Commodore Friends of Music. As a council member, I'll support the Recreation Committee in funding a recreation coordinator and will work to ensure that there are long-term maintenance plans for city infrastructure, including the pool, roads, sidewalk, and stormwater. I understand that in order to effectively serve, you have to be willing to listen, you have to be honest and transparent, and you must be willing to make hard decisions. I understand that we must balance our wants with our needs and make sure that the city is affordable for all residents. Virgins has a bright future, and I would like the opportunity to serve this community as a member of the Virgins City Council. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Tara. <laughs> and I am, am having a problem with the alphabet tonight, so uh, Alderman Austin, would you, like to, would you like to say a few words? Sure. Um, I'm David Austin, and uh, I can't even remember how many terms I've served, but it's, it's a number. Um, <clears throat> uh, I was also chair of the Planning Commission for a number of years here. Um, I came back on the board uh, at the time when Mayor Daniels resigned um, and Rennie assumed the mayor position and that created a, a, an opening. Um, came back on, Mel was looking at retirement. I felt that it was important to have somebody on the council who had a history with the city, uh, which I certainly have. Um, I, uh, I love this place. I feel that there's a number of challenges that we're facing that are not entirely different from other communities of the same size in Vermont. And what that is, is it's how do we remain relevant in a world that's changing? How do we continue to afford to pay for what we need to pay for to adequately provide for the needs of the city? Um, we, we had a double-digit tax increase last year, and I, um, I, I can't see the residents of this city continuing to support increases like that. But at the same time, we're left with, um, you know, what's necessary, and I don't believe that we overspend in any area. I, th I, think, that, I think that we're right where we need to be, but what we do need to do is we need to find other sources of revenue and we're doing that. Our police department is working to establish contracts with our neighboring municipalities. Um, we also have the economic corridor that's a, a ways off, um, but that's, that's going to 
provide some much needed tax revenue. We do have some housing coming on board. Um, the real challenge for us, though, is managing growth. And, um, you know, I, I've spent my entire career in the private sector. I've owned and managed businesses. I've redeveloped a couple buildings here in Virgins. I currently work with a private investment group as the principal. Um, I, I'm very, very familiar with what works and what does not work. Um, our business is targeted to communities, um, unfortunately not in Vermont because of the, the, uh, the price of things here and the economic climate, um, but I spend a lot of time looking at communities that are very similar to wherever Jens was um, and looking at the potential for them to get to where we are. So, you know, I understand where we've been, I understand where we are, and I understand where we want to go. Um, throughout my career, I've come to understand the importance of very, very careful analysis, both from a qualitative and quantitative standpoint. Um, I make decisions based on what's best for this city, period, the end. I don't let any ideological perspective interfere with that. Um, and I've been in the position of having to make some very, very difficult positions. When I was chair of the planning commission and Velco was planning on running a power line down the middle of Main Street, and the city council that was sitting at that time was doing absolutely nothing about it, I went to Montpelier and noticed an appearance on behalf of the planning commission um, to give us legal standing, which if I had not done that, we would have had none. Um, so I, I'm very proud of the fact that I have always taken a very, very um, aggressive stance with what's good for this city, uh, and I'll continue to do that in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Donnelly. Yeah, D comes next. It does. Good evening. I'm Lynn Jackson Donnelly. I have uh, lived, born, and raised, and lived either in Virgins or Panton my entire life. Um, when you're mature as I am, you're, more, you're very likely have to have done many, many things, and I have done those many, many things, um, from everything from the school board to Recreation Committee now. So I don't want to go back over the past. What I want to do is say that I think for Jens has a future that is going to make us all very proud and want our children to stay here. That's what I want. I think we need jobs, we need more housing, and we need people that will come and join these boards, including the school board and the city council. So I look forward to, to serving you again. And I thank you for uh, voting for me in the past. I hope that tomorrow you will do the same. Thank you very much. Thank you. And last but not least, I believe, Rebecca Ray. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rebecca Ray. Uh, I'm also from the area. I was raised on a farm in Addison County, uh, just a small family farm. I moved away for about 15 years, was out west uh, in the big cities and uh, did the corporate thing for a while and moved back when my daughter was two to raise her here because I knew what quality of life meant and it meant being here in Vermont. Uh, so I am really focused on running for this office so that I can help move Regents forward. I mean, I see the potential we have here it's kind of unprecedented. I think we're super lucky to be, just to have the assets we do, and one of those assets is the people here and how we all band together to grow this community and what we've done so far and what we might do. And uh, this economic corridor is one thing that I'm actually super excited about. I think us serving as the hub for the surrounding communities is fabulous. Getting more housing in here, getting the school population back up would be fantastic. And I think we all want these things together, but that's my focus is our future, and I think we have a strong one, and I'm excited, and I hope to be a part of it. Thanks. Thank you.
Moving on, we are, will be electing one lister for a three-year term, which is an uncontested uh, seat on the ballot. One auditor for a three-year term, there is no candidate. One grand juror for a one-year term, there is one candidate. Two commissioners to the Virgins Panton Water District Board of Commissioners for respective three-year terms. We vote for, two, vote for two, and there are two candidates. If the two candidates are here and would like to say something, you're more than welcome to do so. Moving along. And one director to the Addison Northwest School District Board of Directors for a three-year ter three term. There are two candidates. We will be voting for one. And if the candidates are here and would like to speak, I will offer the floor to Martha DeGraff. Hello, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Martha Sullivan DeGraff. I too was uh, born in Virgins, moved to Panton, back to Virgins to raise my family. Um, I chose to put my name in for the school board and as far as um, experience, I have no experience on the school board. I do have experience on other boards. I've been um, active in my children, the Champlain Valley Christian Schools um, fundraising school board, and also I am currently the president of the Your Turn Resale Shop board in Virgins here. Um, I also have been active in our own city for 10 years. I organized and executed the Virgins Junior Fishing Derby, which was a fishing is a fishing derby that we host for youths in Virgins that attract 300 children and their families to the basin. Um, I also, yeah, I also <laughs> organized Trunk or Treat, um, which we held at the, uh, held, which we hold at the American Legion in Virgins, and I've done many, many other things. The parade, yes, I am the speaker for the parade, and I also organized the entries and the participants in that. Um, so I am active, and I would appreciate your vote. I would, um, I'm excited if it happens to get on the school board and to learn more, there's a lot to learn. And I've never had a problem communicating and I'm really hoping that that is the gift that I can bring and possibly um, that, that might, that's something that it sounds like it's needed and I'm hoping that I can do that if I'm elected. Thank you. And Jenna Santa Maria. Hi everyone, my name is Jenna Santa Maria. I was raised in Addison, Vermont, so just the next town over. I moved away um, to attend college and law school. I was gone about 10 years, and I moved back to raise my family. My husband's from New Haven, and we have two little kiddos who will be headed to VUES, one who will start in the fall. So I'm committed to seeing our schools thrive and to continue to engage the public and to have what I really want to do is a public feedback process because I feel like board meetings are ran as business meetings and I understand the need for that. But I think that we need more community engagement and bringing more ideas to the table and having diverse voices heard. Um, like Martha, I believe communication is a gift and I'm pleased to run you know, sadly against Martha, but I know she is a wonderful person, so you will be in great hands with no matter which candidate wins tomorrow. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Moving along on the warning. Articles two and three, the next two articles, are questions that the city council elected to put on the ballot. We are in the process, as you probably know, of revising our city charter. It is a lengthy process and there are a number of issues that have come up and therefore we elected to add the following two articles to the charter, or to the uh, warning rather, excuse me. Article two, to vote by Australian ballot on the following. Shall the city council consider the option of allowing non-citizen legal residents to vote on city local ballots through an amendment to the city charter? Article three, to vote by Australian ballot on the following. 
Shall the City Council consider the option of changing the term of office for the Mayor and City Councilors from two years to three years through an amendment to the City Charter? Article 4. To vote by Australian ballot on the following. Shall the City appropriate $5,000 to Addison County Home Health and Hospice, Inc., said some to come from City funds? Is there a representative here? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Laro. I grew up in Virgins, moved back as an adult because I value this community. And I also really value the work that we do at Addison County Home Health and Hospice. I've worked there for almost two and a half years, and the work that we do is indescribable. In last year, our last fiscal year, we served 217 individuals just in Virgins. That totaled 10,000. 493 visits. That's a lot of visits <laughs> in one year by our incredible staff. We have nurses, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speak, speech language pathologists. We serve people from beginning of life with our maternal child health program and also at the end of life with our hospice program. And I wouldn't have moved back to Virgins and I wouldn't work for this agency if I didn't believe in it. And I do. I've been personally impacted by this organization, and they're incredible. Um, so if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I have my little talking points. Um, but thank you very much for your support. And if, again, ask me anything. I'm, I'm happy, to, happy to help. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Article 5. Shall the city appropriate $2,000 to Addison County Humane Society, Inc., said some to come from city funds? Is there anyone here from the town? I don't need a microphone. I've never done this before. They asked me to be here. And there we go. Thank you, Sorry. Oh, God. I usually have a big mouth, so. Um, for Virgins, the um, Humane Society has, um, there were 21 stray animals from Virgins brought to the Humane Society. The Virgins animals that were surrendered by owners, 49. Um, adopted out to residents of Virgins, 35. Stray animals returned to owners, five. Um, they've neutered or spayed feral cats and returned them to Virgin's caregivers after vaccination. The average cost of care is $149 per animal, and that's their entire budget, not just for Virgin's, and it's all different animals. Um, the average fee for adoption is $84. The cost of care um, covers food, medical costs, shelter, Anyway, it's such a good cause. They do all kinds of education. Um, the, they have a website that explains all this, but it is, they get no funding, no support um, from outside sources. They're run by volunteers, so our contribution really helps these little creatures that have no voice. So I hope we... Thank you. Article 6, shall the city appropriate $3,074 to Addison County Parent Child Center, said some to come from city funds. Hello, my name is Sue Rakowski. I'm a Virgin's resident. I'm going to read a statement on support of the Addison County Parent Child Center. Uh, the support from the local communities is a critical part of their budget in that it allows for flexibility to provide services to all families with young children who request assistance. Last year, your financial support helped the PCC provide services to 296 residents of Virgins. They hope to offer the same services to residents of Virgins next year and kindly request an amount of $3,074. What do the funds support? The PCC helps families to assess their children's physical and cognitive development and provides support services if needed. They also offer, offer consultation and support to families and child care providers around young children's social, 
emotional and behavioral development. Playgroups are offered around the county to promote social interactions for children and parents. The Virgins Playgroup is held on Wednesday mornings at the Congregational Church, and I've made many of my best friends there when I was a young parent. Um, it's open to all area families with young children. All families with newborns are often offered welcome baby bags and visits to introduce them to available services in the county with follow-up supports for those who request it. Uh, learning Together, an intensive in-house training program builds parenting and job readiness skills and serves as an alternative education site for Addison County High Schools. The program focuses on young parents and other teens who are at risk of parenting too young. To complement that program, the center provides high-quality child care to infants and toddlers. The center has also renovated a nine-resident boarding house in Middlebury, which is the cornerstone of a first-time renters program for youth to learn and practice the skills necessary to be successful tenants in our community. All of these services are free for anyone and can be accessed by calling the Addison County Parent Child Center. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. <laughs> Article 7, shall the city appropriate $750 to Addison County Readers, Inc., said some to come from city funds. Hello, I'm Margo Grace, and I'm one of the board members for Addison County Readers. Um, we partner with um, Dolly Parton's Imagination Library to send free books to preschoolers. Um, it's, a, it's completely free to our children that can be signed up as soon as they're born, and they can receive a free book every month until their fifth birthday. We're asking for town support because we're a 100% volunteer board. Uh, all of the funding that we will be raising from the city will go directly to paying our bill to Dolly. As much as it is free to children, she charges us $30 per child per year. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Article 8. Shall the city appropriate $850 to Addison County Restorative Justice Services, Inc., said some to come from city funds? My name is Danielle Wallace. I work for the Restorative Justice. Uh, we're located in Middlebury. We serve all of Addison County, um, really with that balanced restorative approach. Um, in all levels of involvement with the criminal justice system, we work with um, pre-adjudication uh, and post um, through diversion programs as well as support programs to find referrals. Um, talked a little bit about um, people coming out of incarceration. We can offer that population support um, and hopefully connect them to whatever services they need. Uh, it's really important to give people a second chance um, and hopefully can provide that support. And town funding really is a big part of that. Thanks. Thank you. Article 9, shall the city appropriate $2,500 to AgeWell, formerly known as CVAA, said some to come from city funds. Hi, I'm Michelle Eastman. I'm the nutrition coordinator for Addison County for AgeWell. And I actually was not prepared to speak on this tonight. But here I am. AgeWell is an incredible organization. Our mission is to uh, give the confidence for people to age in their homes. We offer all kinds of programs. I can tell you, I think it's over 300 for Jen's residents um, are involved in one way or another. For Jen's seniors will be talked about and, and that's also one of my programs. We're at the Armory Lane Tuesdays and Thursdays for a lunch. I have restaurants all over Addison County that seniors gather at. Everything is free by donation. Um, Matt Byrong has just signed on, and that will be an option for dining as well. There's also Tai Chi that's held at St. Peter's. There is uh, Senior Companions, Care and Services Coordinator, coordinators that, that work all over the county and in Virgins. Um, we are partially federally funded and locally funded as well. Does anyone have questions? I feel like I have this cheat sheet, but it doesn't say anything specific to Virgins. Good, thank you. Great, thank you. 
Article 10. Shall the city appropriate $5,000 to Boys and Girls Club of Greater Virginia, said sums to come from city funds? Good evening. My name is Jill Struby. I'm the executive director of the Boys and Girls Club. Um, first, I would like to thank everyone here for their support of the Boys and Girls Club in the last year. We have done amazing things. We've gotten 146 members, and we started at 87 members just three years ago. Um, our average daily attendance right now is about 28 kids a day, and it used to be seven kids a day. So we're making progress. Um, we opened our far side, which is a special space within our club for our teenagers. So we've seen our teenage membership climb since we now have a special spot for them to hang out, come be with their friends. Um, I think our biggest accomplishment this year is we served 6,400 and 46 meals to our members and to kids um, during the summers. Um, anyone 18 and younger can come eat with us. Um, about 20% of our kids tell us if they don't eat supper with us, they don't eat supper. So that is a huge um, thing that we have been able to do with our kids. Unfortunately, in January 1st of 2021, we will lose our funding for that meals program. So we are especially um, hoping that you will all vote for us because we are going to really need the city appropriated funds to keep that meals program running. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Article 11, shall the city appropriate $2,500 to counseling services of Addison County Inc. said sums to come from city funds. Hi, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to all of you. My name is Rachel Cummings, and I'm the Executive Director of the Counseling Service of Addison County. We are 60, over 60 years old now. We started off as a small family guidance clinic, uh, and over 60 years we have provided mental health support, substance use treatment, and developmental services across Addison County. And in, uh, and in this sit little city, 63,000 hours of service were provided in the last year. Um, we are heavily, we're a nonprofit organization and we're heavily reliant on state and third party payers such as Medicare. Um, with that, every dollar counts and your support matters and it allows us to um, meet more needs of people um, in a very scarce time. So thank you for your consideration. Our mission is, in, is to improve the quality of life for all community members. We promote stable and safe communities by helping people live emotionally healthy and satisfying lives. We work collaboratively with many of the community partners who are here today and businesses in all aspects of our operation. So thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> Article 12. Shall the city appropriate $2,000 to El Elderly Service, Inc., said some to come from city funds? Good evening. I'm Mary Sullivan, born and raised in Virgins, and still here. Um, I'm happy to speak for Elderly Services. It needs an S on that, Elderly Services. And the reason I'm happy is not only do I love this organization, but many of you may not be aware that Elderly Services, like the umbrella, for this organization that does many, many things, uh, nurses, counselors, um, meals, but Project Independence is the piece that I hope that you've heard of. That's really the mainstay of Elderly Services, Project Independence. And without giving you lots of numbers, there are four buses that come to Virgins every single day. Four buses are full every single day, six days a week, and those are our parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, neighbors. Um, if you haven't ever visited this facility, it is, as you're driving into Middlebury, look off to the right and you see this beautiful farmhouse type building, very massive. And this was the vision of Joanne Corbett, who's the executive director. And it was made to look like a comfortable farmhouse, a Vermont farmhouse, it has a pool, it has a little um, putting green. Uh, they do everything for these people who are there. And there are younger people who have, have some um, physical limitations. They've suffered a stroke, perhaps. There are people who just need to be someplace because they're living either alone 
and their family is concerned about them being alone all day every day. So in order to stay in their own homes, they go to Project Independence during the day. I could go on and on, but four full buses from Virgins. It's amazing, and please go down and visit because once you go, I mean, I have the privilege. Lynn joins me, her sister Susan, and other friends. Uh, we go regularly and provide music, um, and it, it's just such a joy, and it's such a wonderful place. So please do support. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Article 13, shall the city appropriate $2,000 to End of Life Services, Inc., formerly known as Hospice Volunteer Services, said some to come from city funds. Is there a representative here this evening? Hi, everybody. My name is Heidi Sulis. I was born in Melrose, Massachusetts, and I hope you'll still listen to me this evening. I am the odd woman out. Um, I am also a hospice volunteer. So let me share with you a little bit about, um, or I, we are end of life services now. Um, in the reporting period for the town of Virgins, End of Life Services provided 18 hospice or palliative patients with 41 volunteers. They provided 132 residents with 98 hours of end of life comfort and support through Wellspring Singers and Harp Therapy. And all of this was at an in kind value of $14,770. They also provided five people with bereavement support, which is a whole nother arm of services they provide. Um, and that was at a value of $5,400. And they provided 17 public education awareness in service events. So just going off the report here that um, Shirley prepared for me, um, I would just say as a hospice volunteer that it is very gratifying to support people at end of life. Um, and we are generally, I think, so well received, and it's a pleasure to be part of that journey with people. And I would encourage you to continue to support the organization that you've been supporting for a long time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Article 14, shall the city appropriate $3,000 to hope, said some to come from city funds. Hi there. How do you do? My name is Mike Nason. I'm a board member for HOPE. I live in Lincoln. Um, HOPE really is an acronym for helping overcome poverty's effect. If you don't know it, you don't have to look very far. There's poverty all around us. Uh, HOPE has been operating in Addison County since 1965. It is a 501 3C organization. We absolutely could not operate without local support. Virtually every town in uh, Addison County provides support to HOPE through town grants, uh, such as we're asking uh, you to provide. Uh, the grants are, uh, the support is based largely on population. The average per capita contribution from a town is $1.28. Uh, the Virgins per capita contribution is 77 cents. The uh, lowest contribution from a town is 41 cents. And the uh, highest contribution is over $4. Uh, we've provided assistance this year in, uh, not this year, but uh, 2019 to 2,952 people. 328 of them are from Virgins. The types of services we provide are food shelf. Uh, last year we provided 78,000 meals uh, um, to people in Addison County. We have a resale store that provides clothing, household goods, kitchenware, and generates uh, over half of our revenue uh, for operating. We also provide financial assistance with rents, mortgage payments, and home repairs also for car repairs and gas so people can get to work, assistance with prescriptions and emergency medical and dental care, uh, assistance to the homeless, 
by providing hotel rooms, showers, laundry, and camping equipment. Also, budgeting, counseling, and diet, and food preparation counseling. Our sources of income are uh, individual contributions. Over a third of our operating uh, uh, funds come from people making individual gifts, but also from grants from federal, state, and philanthropic uh, organizations. Town grants, um, such as we're asking uh, Virgins for, account for $41,000 um, of our operating. United Way provides us with $20,000, and our resale store uh, generates $560,000. Uh, so we thank you for your past support and uh, hope that we can count on the uh, city of Virgins for continued support. Any questions or? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Article 15, shall the city appropriate $4,000 to John Graham Housing and Services, said some to come from city funds. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everybody. My name is Pete Kellerman. I'm joined here tonight with uh, one of our board members, Sean Dye, a local. Thank you for coming. Um, John Graham Housing and Services provides shelter, food, and services to a wide variety of Addison County's homeless population. And that homeless population is made up of, of, of quite a few people who have suffered trauma in a variety of ways, whether it's through economic hardship whether it's through a variety of disabilities, mental health, addiction, those who've suffered domestic violence, and their needs are deep and they're real, and they require a great deal of compassion and kindness, and I'm happy to say that a lot of that has come from the city of Virgins. The John Graham Shelter is celebrating its 40th year here in Virgins. And I almost feel like, you know, I'm, if I, was, I was Academy Award winner where I got to thank so many people. And we're going to make an effort to do that at some point this year when we have a 40th celebration here in town. And we're going to make sure that we acknowledge all the great help that we've gotten along the way. Um, we have a small staff. There's only three full-time folks. We have about three or four uh, part-timers and a couple of AmeriCorps service members to provide a high level of service coordination to those whom we serve. We're tiny but mighty. But we have been around for 40 years, and in that time, we've added capacity by adding four more houses. So the John Graham Housing and Services owns five buildings altogether, three of which are here in Virgins. One is in Middlebury, and one is in Bristol trying to provide an opportunity to expand both shelter space and also to provide low-income housing for those who need it. Most of them graduate through our program. Um, I'm very proud to be a part of a community of service, many of who are, I've, I've spoken previous to me coming up and will follow thereafter. Um, but I can't thank the city of Virgins enough at this point in time for 40 years of uh, supporting the John Graham Shelter and those whom we serve. And so we're gonna ask that you continue to do so. And in return, we're gonna continue to pledge our dedication uh, to take care of those who have great needs. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Article 16. Shall the city appropriate $1,000 to Open Door Clinic, said some to come from city funds? Do we have a representative? Hello again. Um, I am uh, speaking now as the executive director of the Open Door Clinic and um, would like to start by saying thank you for your support through the years and I hope you'll continue to support us. We are a free clinic for the uninsured and underinsured in Addison County. 
And in order to serve the people that we serve, we can't charge for any of our services. So um, it's an ongoing challenge to fundraise and find new constellations of grants, et cetera. And um, towns are one of the ways um, I request funding from 19 towns in Addison County. So as I said last year, you're not alone. And your support really helps us um, fulfill our mission. And before I gave you some stats, I just want to underscore something that Pete said. Being here tonight in this group and seeing people who have helped raise my children, um, who we collaborate with on a daily basis to serve the people we're serving, um, and who donate generously to our organization makes our jobs easier. And we're really grateful for that. I see a lot of you who support us in a lot of different ways. Um, and it's a pleasure to be in a community where there's so much connectedness. Um, in the reporting period that I'm speaking to you about, uh, sorry, um, which was July 1st to June 30th, we saw 51 patients from Virgens for a total of 163 medical visits, 38 dental visits, um, and 29 visits with our Vermont Health Connect navigator, Melanie Clark, who some of you may know. Um, and you actually, the town of Virgens tied with the town, the city of Virgens tied with the town of Shoreham for um, the most, the highest number of people we saw from any one town. So we serve a lot of folks from Virgens. Um, we do that in Middlebury. We have uh, a clinic in Middlebury seven times a month, and then we see people twice a month here in Virgens. And I think, without belaboring things, I just want to say one of the things we're most proud of lately is um, our dental program, which is really growing. Um, and while there still remains a big gap in oral health care in this community, I, I'd like to say we're making a little tiny dent in that um, through a whole new constellation of volunteers. Um, and we had 170 volunteers last year help us take care of all the people we did. So. And we're growing. Um, we saw almost 1,000 people last year, 425 of whom were new patients to us. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Article 17. Shall the city appropriate $1,000 to Otter Creek Child Center, Inc., said some to come from city funds? Hi, good evening. My name's Damina Noonan and I'm here to represent Otter Creek. Um, one of the core aspects of Otter Creek Child Center that's located in Middlebury that has been there for over 35 years um, is to serve all of Addison County and to make quality childcare accessible for all families. And we do that um, by the use of a scholarship fund. And the monies that Virgins has um, allotted Otter Creek Child Center over the years has been put towards that scholarship fund. You know, with the stresses that families are facing, and we've heard some of those realities shared to us tonight by other uh, social service agencies, we have a lot of the children um, of these parents who are in our care. Currently, there are 47% of the children enrolled, and there's a daily enrollment of 45 children that are receiving tuition assistance. And that's a very high percent. Otter Creek is a 501c3, and we real, um, depend on uh, funds from the various towns. Currently, we're giving out over $20,000 a year in scholarship assistance. And so this $1,000 helps tremendously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Article 18, shall the city appropriate $950 to RSVP of Addison County, said some to come from city funds. I'm here to tell you about Addison County, the RSVP of Addison County. 
It stands for Retired Senior Volunteer Program. RSVP placed volunteers 55 and older in local service and nonprofit organizations, allowing them to increase their, their capacity to serve the community. An example would be for those uh, receiving um, Meals on Wheels. RSVP provided free community programs that benefited Virgin's residents to keep them healthy, engaged, and financially stable. The health and osteoporosis prevention classes, which is also known as the Bone Builders, were held at the Armory Lane Housing and the Virgin's Residential Care Home as well as 19 other locations within Addison County. The, IR, the RSVP Help Fight Hunger Program provided food staples to the Virgin's uh, food shelf. RSVP partnered with AARP to provide free income tax return services to over 500 low-income uh, families, seniors, at the Bixby Library. We have a Warm Hands, Warm Hearts program. They donated, uh, people knitted, crocheted things, donated over 100 blankets and warm clothing to local schools, nursing homes, social service agencies, including the Virgins Union Elementary School, Virgins Residential Care Home, the Ringer Care Home, and the John Graham Housing and Services Home during the winter months. Not only was it the uh, blankets and shawls and mittens and gloves, um, these were all provided. The Green Mountain Foster Grandparent Program, they provided many hours of classroom support to students at the Virgins Union Elementary School. During this past year alone, about 300 members volunteered over 4,000 hours to support the needs of the community, equating to approximately one and a half million dollars of volunteer time. RSVP offers many more volunteer programs, too many to mention here tonight, and could always use more help. Lynn Bosworth, the program coordinator, is here sitting beside me tonight and uh, she has informational material if anyone is interested in joining. And I say, volunteering for me keeps me away from my refrigerator. <laughs> Thanks again for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Article 19, shall the city appropriate $1,500 to Turning Point Center of Addison County, said some to come from city funds. So I'm Danielle, I'm the um, Vice President of the Board of Turning Point. Uh, so Turning Point of Addison County um, works on a peer recovery um, system. So it focuses on supporting people that are struggling with um, substance use disorder or their families, which is something that touches so many people um, today. Um, so it's um, run by volunteers and staff members that um, are trained and have knowledge and vested interest in recovery um, focus and are, are able to give people one-on-one -on -one support. Um, so just a little bit of the um, statistical uh, population. So they it was... So they had, um, as far as our um, sign-ins um, recorded, the number of times people access services, so 10,538. Um, so 950 people um, came in for one-on-one, -on -one, which would be like a peer support coach. Uh, and then 7,596 people attended 682 peer support recovery meetings. Um, so that would be like AA, NA, 12-step recovery meetings. Uh, 236 doses of Narcan were disc um, distributed, and um, 1,222 hours were donated um, by our dedicated volunteers. So town funding is really important to continue these services for people in need uh, and to keep this going and keep the recovery focus going. Thank you. 
Article 20. Shall the city appropriate $2,000 to Virginia's Area Seniors Association, Inc., said some to come from city funds? Hi, my name is Luanne Dogster. I'm vice president of the, at the Virginia Seniors. Um, the Virginia Seniors is, is, you know, asking for the money to help with the thing. It's open on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 10 to 1. It's held at 50 Armory Lane. We have coffee. We have a coffee bar. They have bingo. The people can come. They can play cards and other activities. We have official meetings uh, on the second Tuesday of every month. And um, we, do, we have the meetings uh, that are there. We are always looking to add new members to, the, to our, our senior group. And it's, uh, our mission is to combat social isolation and build friendships, which is really great. There, the overview is there are 67 seniors that participate in the events and come to the meals and the trips. Um, and how our funds were used were, uh, you know, they stock the cof coffee bar. It's like they have the fun entertainment for the, our summer larger barbecue and the, the picnic, and we provide various um, holiday decorations that are there. There are bingo supplies, puzzle, that there's a puzzle group that they have that they'll be able to, that they can do while they're there. Um, they offset the senior copay for our annual fall trip, because we have a trip in the fall every year, and it's like this year we got to basically to go to uh, the cold, uh, hollow cider mill and we had lunch at the at a history talk at the trap family lodge which was probably the best trip that we basically had everyone enjoyed themselves and it was like a day that was really uh, and it's really nice to hear the history of what basically is going on because a lot of people didn't even know the place existed and what the story was with the family so it was it worked out really well and we, and for the postage stamps to you know send cards to our our people that are the local residents that are, you know, are ill or whatever, and just thinking of them. The Virgin Seniors is thankful for your continued support, and we're just really thrilled that you, you know, find it, that you do support us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Article 21. Shall the city appropriate $890 to Vermont Adult Learning, said some to come from city funds? Hi, I'm Sue Smithson. I am the office manager of Vermont Adult Learning. We provide educational opportunities to people through Vermonters 16 years and older. We have a GED program. We have a high school completion program. We do a whole bunch with um, getting folks ready to move into the workforce. We uh, support individuals in college. And last year, we served um, a 107 Addison County residents. 15 were from Virgins. We offered 1,316 hours of educational support to those folks from Virgins. Uh, currently, our oldest uh, student is 83 years old. He decided three years ago it was time to learn how to read. And we met today with a 16-year-old girl who's not making it into a local school who's going to become our student. So please consider it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Article 22. Shall the city appropriate $4,000 to Women Safe Inc. Said, come, said some to come from city funds. He's always helping me. Um, so my name's Annie Burmeister, and I work at Women's Safe. I'm the education and training coordinator. This is my lovely friend and colleague, um, Jenna. And we, well, Jenna is an advocate, and we're going to share our, our information for you. Um, so every year I do this, most years, and I tend to go on and on. So. Instead of doing that to you all, because I know we're last and people want to leave, I'm going to read something that's very, uh, very uh, efficiently written for you. 
Um, Women Safe provides a variety of services that strive to meet the needs of all people who experience stalking, dating, domestic, or sexual violence. We define advocacy as the active support of a person's goals by providing information and options to assist that person in making their own choices. It's a critical part of that. We provide emotional support, information and referral, support groups and advocacy uh, in the following areas through free and confidential 24-hour hotline and in-person meetings. So I like to look at it as we two different paths. One path is direct service, where we're working with individuals, and the other path is prevention and education, because we would love to put ourselves out of business someday. That's the ultimate goal. Um, so our direct service, we do civil and criminal legal uh, work. So we go to court every, every week um, for relief from abuse orders to support people who need them or who want our support. Um, and beyond that, with some divorces, um, custody cases, we're there in whatever way they want support. Uh, we also make, uh, we link up folks with uh, lawyers who are able to support them if it gets to that point. Um, we go to hospitals and meet with people who are there um, post-abusive uh, situation as well as uh, sexual violence perpetration. Um, we go to uh, a lot of different community meetings and before I forget that, I want to say uh, thank you to everybody. I see so many faces here, I know, because I work with you every day almost, it feels like. I was looking at the list and even uh, I, I think almost everybody on that list who's here today speaking to you, we've collaborated with in some capacity. Um, the Humane Society is an, a great partner because you would be surprised how often um, a love for an animal is a barrier to leaving a home. I'm not surprised. I would live in my car if I couldn't give up my animals, period. Um, so our uh, work with the Humane Society is critical for people looking to f get safe. Um, we have MOU partners in, in state and federal grants here from the John Graham Shelter to the Parent Child Center to CSAC um, and of course our work with the for Jen's police department is ongoing and very collaborative and we're grateful for that. So I think everybody should get what they're asking for tonight. Um, we also do a lot of systems work, um, often when we're working with other um, larger uh, institutions, there's a lack of awareness and understanding of domestic violence and sexual violence and the trauma that people endure and how that might present um, while they're trying to get their needs met through other institutions, so we often um, are fighting for people and their needs. And then we also have education and prevention, which I run, and we are in schools throughout the county. Um, in this, well, I guess we have three districts, um, and we're in almost every school in the, in the county. Uh, we are in Virgin's Elementary, Virgin's Middle School, and Virgin's High School doing work K through 12. It's all prevention around sexual abuse. Um, obviously, what we talk about to kindergartners is very different than 12th graders, but it's all pretty much the same thing around consent and um, communication and healthy awareness of other people and empathy. Uh, I think that's the main piece of what we do, and Jenna's gonna do stats, thanks. So I'm the outreach advocate at Women's Safe. I also provide all the core advocacy, so I go with folks um, to RFA hearings or custody, divorce, anything that they want basically for assistance to provide options. Um, we also have a 24-hour hotline that we run with volunteers and staff, so it's a crisis hotline, so we are always available to people. Last year, Women's Safe staff and volunteers provided the following total services. 4,800 in-person meetings and phone calls to a total of 515 people. We worked with caregivers and a total of 325 children who were exposed to violence. We conducted 213 supervised visits and monitored exchanges for 23 children. We also have a supervised exchange program, which is critical. Um, our prevention programming reached 
2,572 adults and youth um, through 355 workshops, 940 adults and youth through 32 outreach services. We have amazing volunteers, 75 of them, who donated 8,691 hours of service, and we are forever grateful for our volunteers. Um, for, for Jen specifically, um, we provided advocacy services to at least 45 residents, um, including the parents of at least 24 children who were exposed to violence. And it's just important to note that for safety, some people do not feel comfortable giving their town of residence. Um, we did 17 presentations to 158 students and nine adults at the Virgins area schools, three presentations to 100 students and 10 adults at the Northland Job Corps. As part of my work, I do support groups at Joblin North, uh, sorry, Northland Job Corps and also at Valley Vista here in town, and I run a support group at the Virgins Union High School. So we are all about Virgins, and we thank you for your continued support. Thank you. Article 23 is to transact any other non-binding business that may be come before the meeting. This is your opportunity to speak if anyone would like to do so. Yes, please. Um, thank you all. I really don't like speaking in public, so bear with me, I'm a little nervous. Um, so my name is Neil Rele, and, and thank you for your patience uh, to Hear some of my thoughts today, and I apologize. It's I'll try to be quick. Uh, I know it's late in the evening already. Um, I'm speaking with you to humbly urge you to vote yes on Article Two tomorrow. This would recommend that City Council. Sorry, uh, this would recommend that City Council extend the right to vote in local elections to legal non-citizen residents. As a non-citizen resident myself, this is an issue that I obviously deeply care about. Um, I have lived in the United States my entire adult life, and half that time has been here in our brave little state. My partner and I moved to Virginia two years ago, and it's been the most incredible place to live. Um, while this measure would, would directly impact um, only a few people, uh, this, is, this is way more than just the pra about the practical implications. It sends a powerful message that we are committed to the values that makes Vermont what the place it is today, a place that tells all in its community that we are valued, included, and welcome. This is about, at the end of the day, inviting more people into the civic process while we're all here today, right? Um, adopting this measure would make Vermont the third city in the state and the smallest community in the whole country to adopt non-local, non-citizen voting rights for a local residents. I, for one, I pay state taxes, I pay federal taxes, I have since I was in college, um, I own a home in Virginia. As a result, I proudly pay property taxes as well, and I care about how that, min that money is, is used in our community here in Virginia. I actively volunteer my time with United Way. I serve on their board. I'm also running the, the search for, for the Bixby, and I'm, I'm so excited that, that we have a wonderful set of applicants for that position that we'll start reviewing shortly. Um, I advocate proudly for, for our businesses, um, and our little city. I hope we've had a little bit of something to do with helping um, more folks move here to Vigens. So I believe that I'm doing my part and I kind of believe that I deserve a voice in our community. Um, you might have heard or you might yet hear some hesitation, so let me clarify a few points. This measure would only extend to legal residents of this community, your neighbors already not people simply transiting through. Burlington's proposal, for example, extends this right to legal residents of Vermont who've been here in Vermont for two years, and in Burlington specifically for one year. And that's something similar, perhaps, what we will propose. Um, I've also heard some people say that, that voting is a privilege just reserved for citizens. And you know, question why all of a sudden um, others should be deserving of a vote in local elections. So let's take a quick look, look at, at history here, right? Um, the state of Vermont stripped the right for non-citizen, legal non-citizens to vote um, in local elections, not in 1777 or 1877, but in 1977, just 43 years ago. I've also some f heard some folks say, including on Front Porch Forum today, why not become a citizen then, right? <laughs> Those people uh, clearly have not tried to become a US citizen. I'm in the middle of the process right now, and as are many non-citizens, and we can't wait to be full citizens 
in a place we call home. But this is a process in reality that can often take decades and is one of the most arduous and expensive processes to naturalization in the entire world. And as these years go by, it's hard to accept that in the meantime that I need to stay quiet and that I'm not a valued member of this community because I know that I am. I've also listened to certain folks complain that this might be hard because it means creating a separate voting list as non-citizens cannot vote in national or state elections. That's pretty real, this is an excuse. This is a fairly minor logistical challenge if you think about it. And it's, it might be a handful of people. Uh, as per the last census, it was about a dozen people. And it does not mean, though, that this is unimportant or insignificant for these people. It's certainly significant for me. Over these last couple of weeks where we've been talking about this with neighbors, I've met a handful of incredible non-citizens who call Virgin's home and who have shared their stories with me, and I'm proud to represent them today. And I ask you to take a second to put yourselves in the position of one of us. Uh, for the first time, it would be my first time voting in any election back in India or here, um, and just think about what that would mean and what that would feel like. Vermont has always been at the forefront of social progress, and this is not because we lean one way or another politically, right? It's because we do this. We see each other, we hear each other, we listen to each other, and we can hold compassion in our hearts. So to be brave and to be bold, to be independent, to lead with heart, and to believe in the strength of the community is what it means to be a Vermonter to me. It's been hurtful to hear uh, some of the opponents because I truly honestly believe that the democratic process is not a fixed pie, right? Our democracy belongs to everyone and in a land where we so often hear about you know, political apathy or low voter turnout, when you have people who are showing up and asking for the permission to be a part of the civic process, to be a part of the democratic process, it just doesn't seem to me right, doesn't seem right to me to turn them away. So thank you for your support. Uh, fingers crossed it passes tomorrow. It really would be a gift and an honor and not a responsibility to take it lightly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments from the floor? All right then, hearing none. The ballot boxes will remain open from nine o'clock in the forenoon until seven o'clock in the afternoon on Tuesday, March 3rd, 2020 at the Virgins Fire Station on Green Street for voting by Australian ballot on articles one through 22. The legal voters of the city of Virgins are further notified that voter for qualification, registration, and voting, absentee voting shall be as provided in chapters 43 and 51 of Title 17 Vermont statutes annotated. With there being no further business before this meeting, we will recess until Tuesday, March 3rd at 9 a.m. for voting by Australian ballot at the Virgins Fire Station. Thank you, everyone.